Well, good morning. It's Well, y'all were quiet this morning. You were ready and waiting. How are you? It's so good to see you. I hope you've had a good week. Hasn't it been a beautiful week uh, with the temperatures? I think you had more rain than where I was at. Um, I was suffering for Jesus at the beach this week. But it was it was a great week. Thank you so much for allowing me to be away and get a little rest. And uh, I know that uh, you are in good hands here. You know, it's a blessing as a pastor to know he can go away and everybody's going to worship and everybody's going to have a great week uh, in church. And that was a blessing to me. So thank you. But I tell you what, it's always good to be back home. How many of you know that? And there's no place like Shiloh. We say it and I believe it. And it is true. So thank you for worshiping with us today. And it's certainly good for me to be back with you. And I want to say a special word of greeting and welcome to all of our guests today. And what a blessing it is to have guests with us each and every Sunday to worship with us. We thank you for your time. We thank you that you would come worship with us. Uh, in your worship bulletin is a little tear-off section called the connection card right there on that bottom right. If you would take just a moment and fill that out, we appreciate that so much. It tears out, and a little bit later in the service when the offering plate goes by, you can drop that in, and we'll get those. It's always, I enjoy seeing who worship with us. I enjoy praying for you and knowing a little bit about you. So thank you for doing that. If you have a special prayer need, on the back of that same connection card, you can tell us how we could pray specifically. If you have a specific prayer need, we would love to be able to pray for you. So please do that. Again, it tears out. Drop them in the offering plate when it goes by. And we would love to be able to pray for you this week. And I don't know about you, but I missed worshiping with you last Sunday. But I'm looking forward to worshiping today. So uh, Benji, come and lead us today. Please stand as we begin our worship singing, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face.
Good morning. morning. Scripture reading today is going to come from Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 40 and 41. It says, Then a man with uh, serious skin disease came to him, him being Jesus, and on his knees begged him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Verse 41 says, Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him. Be made clean. Uh, the phrase that stands out to me in this text, of course, is moved with compassion. Jesus looked at this man, a man who no one would go near because of his, um, because of his unsightly condition. And it says that he was moved with compassion, moved with love in his heart. He could have spoken healing over him, or he could have you know, perhaps told him to go down to the river and wash himself clean. But Jesus told, uh, chose to do the unthinkable. He touched him. Maybe you need a touch from Jesus today and for whatever you're dealing with. And the way to move the heart of God is by doing what this leper did. Come as you are and admit that you need a Savior. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, we thank you for the ability and just the, the opportunity to come together before you and worship together as one body of believers. We're so humbled that, um, Lord, that that you would allow us to do this freely and in a country that allows it, Lord. But uh, also just uh, amazed that we can still do this today, like um, just to come together and, and lift up songs of praise to you, Lord, and you hear us. Um, you're, you're close. Through your, through your Holy Spirit, you're, you're with us. And um, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to also uh, not, not, not only come to you with a heart of, uh, with a heart of begging for for healing and, and things like that, knowing that you have a heart of compassion, Lord, but help us to also have a heart of compassion for other people. Lord, let us be a light in our community, in our workplaces, in our families, and even here at church, Lord. I pray that you'd help us to uh, set a good example of what it means to be like Christ, sacrificially living for the purpose of pointing others to you, uh, knowing you and, and making you known, Father God. And let's ask all of these things in your holy and precious name.
stand once more as we sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. All right, if you've got your Bibles, open them to the book of Revelation this morning. Revelation chapter 3. Uh, to all of our guests, just to bring you up to date, we've been um, going through, uh, we've started walking through the book of Revelation together on Sunday morning. And over the past several weeks, we have looked at the seven churches. We're going to look at the last church that um, the Lord addressed a letter to today in chapter 3, the church at, uh, the church at Laodicea. And uh, before we get into the message, I wanted to just say how good it is. I don't see her now. Haley was in here. How good it is to have Dylan and Haley and Zeke home. And I know little Charlie Jean is just thrilled to have them home and um, thank you for praying for them. I know that they would want you to know that. And uh, Haley was right. Um, God has answered a lot of prayers on their behalf. Um, they went to India to adopt that precious little boy, Zeke. And now he is here uh, at his, in his new home. You continue to pray for them and pray for little Zeke because it's going to be quite an adjustment for him. But I'm excited to see how God continues to work and move. He's already done so much. You know, sometimes we forget to stop and give thanks for the answered prayers, don't we? Amen. But God answers so many, so many of our prayers. He answers all of our prayers in his love and wisdom. You know, as I look across this congregation this morning, I see people that we have that have been sick at one time or another that we have prayed for and here you are amen? amen people sometimes ask me if i believe that god still heals today one hundred and twenty thousand percent amen? amen if you're sitting here he's healed you at some point whether it was a cold whether it was a virus whether it was a headache our god still heals and he is with us. And so he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can heal in an instant. He can use medicine. He, he's given doctors wisdom. 
And aren't you thankful? Uh, but God is our healer. Every good and perfect gift from, comes from the Father above. Aren't you thankful for that? As we begin today, I want to open with a word of prayer, and then we'll go to the scripture. Father, we thank you so much. Lord, we want to pause. We want to slow down. Father, we want to breathe just in your presence. Just to be aware of how great and mighty you are. Just to be re reminded of your amazing grace. Just to remember the day that Jesus saved our souls. Father, just to give thanks for every answered prayer. And Father, you have answered so, so, so many. Lord, we praise you. And you're worthy of our praise. Father, as we sometimes in the busyness of life, sometimes in all of the things that distract us, we forget. Lord, we forget who you are. We forget your power. We forget your love. We forget your grace and your mercy. We forget that you give us every breath we breathe. Father, we forget of the price our sin cost us. You, as Jesus died on the cross. But today, may we remember and may we give thanks. May we be renewed and revived in our hearts and in our spirits. Lord, stir that passion we have for Jesus once again. May the fire we have for him burn brighter in the days ahead of us than it ever has in the past. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' precious and mighty name. Amen and amen. Today, as we continue our journey through Revelation, we're going to look at the church at Laodicea, beginning in verses 14 through 22. And the title of my message today is, Where Has the Passion Gone? Where has the passion gone? We're going to look. Laodicea was called the lukewarm church. They were neither cold nor hot. They were lukewarm. And the Lord had a word for this church. And as we've studied the letters to the churches, Jesus' word to these seven churches, some of the churches, he had a word of um, a complimentary word to them. He had words of warning. As we come to the church of Laodicea, there is not a complimentary word to this church. But it is a church that he awakens, tries to awaken out of the slumber they're in. And he tells them and he gives them, he gives them a word of hope of how they can pull out of this slump that they're in. And I want us to pay attention closely because it's a very relevant word to many of our churches today. You know, as I was thinking about this message and how our hearts should should never grow tired of thinking about Jesus, of proclaiming the gospel, of walking with Jesus. I thought of my, my friend who just recently got a new little puppy, a little golden retriever, a little golden retriever named Ruby Lee. And this pastor has already fallen in love with this dog. I've determined I'm not going to get one, but I sure would like to. Little Ruby Lee right now is only about this tall. And listen, she is a ball of energy. But the thing that I love about Ruby Lee is when I see her, it is like she has just met her best friend in the whole world. She comes and there is so much excitement and enthusiasm and she jumps up and she there is nothing but love coming out of this puppy. And she wants to love you and she wants to play. She wants to be in your presence. And you know what, for my friend who owns little Ruby Lee, she'll lay down beside him and she'll rest her head on his lap every chance she gets. There's a trust there. Ruby Lee knows who her human is. She knows who her daddy is and she looks to him to take care of her. And you know, as I, as I was watching little Ruby Lee one day and she was playing and she was so excited 
and everything. And I thought, you know, that's how we as believers should be when we come into the presence of the Lord. When we realize that we're coming to worship, when we realize that we're coming into his presence, we should be so overjoyed and so excited that Jesus is our Savior. And for what he's done for us, amen? amen. But what happens to us as we get older? What happens to us? Maybe the day we were saved and we trusted Christ as our Savior. We were excited that day. I remember looking forward to the day I was baptized. I was so excited the day I was baptized. But sometimes the cares of life and, and all begin to distract us. And you know what? That joy and excitement that maybe we once had in walking with the Lord begins to wane a little bit. Why is that? I think we have an enemy who seeks to distract us, who wants that joy and excitement to wane, who wants us to take our eyes off our Savior. And sometimes we forget of how much we need Jesus. Amen? The church at Laodicea had lost its passion. They no longer felt dependent on the Lord. They no longer looked to Him for their needs. They were quite self-sufficient. And they had become a lukewarm church. Just to give you a little bit of background and to help you understand the setting of the church at Laodicea. It was a wealthy commercial center, the city of Laodicea. So there was a lot of wealth there. They were known for banking, uh, the manufacturing of clothing, especially a, a beautiful black wool that they would make clothes from. And, and so it was a very wealthy city. And they were famous for a medical school there that would make ointments for the, for the eyes and Ointments for the ears to cure different issues with the eyes and the ears. And so this city was very prosperous. And it was in this city that this church, we really don't know how this church was started. Um, some have said that this church was composed of all non-believers. But we don't know that for sure. But we do know that Jesus certainly had a strong word for this church. And you know what? There, there's, a, there's a lesson here for all of us. Um, we need to be careful how our, how our culture impacts us as believers and as a church. The city and the church here at Laodicea were alike. They did not need the help of anyone. Including God. In fact, this city, the city of Laodicea, they were so wealthy and had it so together. They had a devastating earthquake in A.D. 60. And Laodicea rebuilt itself without any assistance from Rome. They had all they needed. They were quite self-sufficient. They didn't need the help of anyone, including God. They were all fine by themselves. And the church for sure was badly deceived. You know, churches that lose sight of their dependence on Christ for all things are deceived and useless. Jesus graciously promises healing to all who will rely on him for their every need. And he gives them that word as well. But they needed to understand where they were spiritually so that he could help them spiritually. And that's what we see in this letter to Laodicea. Would you look with me in the scripture? Revelation 3 verses 14 to 22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Remember in every letter, Christ is introduced in a different way. And here he is the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. And he says, I know your works that you are neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. 
That's a strong word. In verse 17, he says, Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. One translation says, be enthusiastic and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also have over, overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so as we look at this church at Laodicea, um, I want to remind us to look at what, how Jesus is introduced to this church. He is, uh, he is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He is the amen. Listen, um, this is God's story. Amen. And he's the one writing the story and he will have the last word. You know, as we look at all that's going on in our world today. And the government and the United States and the world situation in Afghanistan as we look at well, how COVID has, has, has made its around around the world and how it has disrupted everything. Sometimes it looks like everything is out of control. But I want to remind you, and we, as we've said time and time again, that our Heavenly Father is in, the, in control. He's still on the throne. He is the amen. And he will have the last word. And when you know Christ, the last word is a victorious word. Aren't you thankful for that? He is the trusted and faithful and true witness. In a day where it is so hard to trust anyone, we can't trust the news reports. We can't trust articles we reread. You wonder, if is this article true? Is this one false? Is that one true? Is this one false? Do I need to listen to that person or this person or that person? Sometimes even preachers are not true to God's word. And so you wonder. But my friend, I want to point you to the one who is always true. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the trusted. He is the faithful one. He is the true witness. Amen. And he's the only one who has died for your sin and my sin and the sin of the world. He's the only one who was buried in a tomb. And rose again the third day. And with a group of 12 disciples. He's rocked the world. Even to this day. Revelation 22. A little bit later. In Revelation 22 verse 13. He said I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. In fact if we've got a moment. I want to flip over to Revelation chapter 22. So if you've got your Bibles, let's look over there. And I want us to read verses 12 through 17 of Revelation 22. I want you to listen to our Savior's words here. And behold, I am coming quickly. We've seen that before, haven't we? And he's telling us, and it's true. I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. There it is. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually Immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. 
I am the root and the offspring of David, the bride and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let who, him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. I love that. Our Savior offers us an invitation to come. He's a Savior who is always inviting us. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Our precious Savior offers salvation and life to anyone who will receive. He invites us to come. That's who is speaking to this church at Laodicea. Even though he's going to bring them a hard word about their spiritual condition, even out of the gate, he's reminded them of who he is. I am the Amen. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I am the faithful and true one. I am the true witness. And so he is reminding them of who is speaking to them. And the second thing we see in this passage is the dilemma of being lukewarm. Look at verse 16 and 17 again. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. The dilemma of being lukewarm. You are neither hot nor cold. They were passionless. They were lukewarm. They had lost their passion for the gospel. They had lost their passion for Christ. They had lost their passion for prayer. They had lost their passion to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those around them. They were passionless. And Jesus said, I would rather you either be hot or cold. And he says, he will vomit you out of my mouth. In other words... Rejecting you with disgust. That word. That word the scripture uses vomit. I hate that word. Just saying it. Makes me feel ill. Why would Jesus say. Such a thing to this church. You know I told you they lived in. Laodicea. The city. Now one thing about this city. As wealthy as they were, as self-sufficient as, as they were, there was one thing they did not have. They did not have a good source of drinking water in their city. And so they had to bring water in by aqueducts. And one of the cities that they would bring water in from was Hier Hierapolis. And Hierapolis uh, got its water from, from hot springs. And so, so as Laodicea would bring water in from Hierapolis by the aqueducts, the water from the hot springs would cool. And by the time it got to Laodicea, it was what? Lukewarm. How many of you like to go turn your water on and get a nice cool drink of water? Well, here in Laodicea, they never got a nice cool drink of water. And it must have tasted bad as well by the time it reached them. Another place they would draw water from was Colossae. Now, it was a cooler source of water. And so in Colossae, if you were to drink their water, it was a nice, refreshing, cold water that they had access to. But guess what? By the time it traveled the aqueducts to Laodicea, guess what? It was lukewarm. And for all of its wealth that the city had, they had very poor drinking water. The water was so distasteful that visitors not prepared for its tepid flavor would often vomit after drinking it. And so Jesus gives this church a very visual illustration of their spiritual condition. 
They were passionless. They had lost their zest for the Lord. They were neither cold nor hot. To the point it just made you want to throw up. And as Jesus looked in their hearts and saw their spiritual condition, that they were self-sufficient, they didn't need anything, they didn't need Him. They had lost their passion for the gospel. They had lost their passion for prayer. Jesus said, it makes me want to throw up. That's a hard word to receive. Let me ask you something. Where in your life are you passionless? Tepid. Lukewarm. Some of you have lost your passion in your marriage. Perhaps you quit investing in your marriage. Perhaps you're so used to being married, you're just coasting along. Maybe you don't tell each other you love each other like you once did. Maybe you never go on a date anymore. And the things you did, gentlemen, to win that lady's heart, you no longer do. Ladies, the thing you used to do to win that fella's heart, you no longer do. Because you've, what? you've grown comfortable. And that's where so many marriages get in trouble. Because some little lady at his office begins to pay attention to him. Or some gentleman fellas will begin to notice your wife. And maybe begin to flirt a little bit. So be careful that your marriages don't become passionless. But that you do what it takes to stir that passion like you always did. If you're married, tell your spouse every day that you love them. If you're married, gentlemen, be the spiritual leader in your home and take your wife by the hand and pray with her before she goes out the door to work that day. Quit pinching pennies to the point that you never take her out to eat at a nice restaurant. I know what you're thinking, Pastor. You've done gone to Medlin. Yes, I have. <laughs> but your marriage is worth it. And you need to stoke those fires of love and passion for your spouse in a day and a culture where... Um, where it is so hard to make it for the long haul. If Christ is not at the center, and that's the other thing, as a couple, stay involved in church. And I'm preaching to the choir this morning. But so many people, just like the church at Laodicea, professing Christians, no longer see their need for Christ, no longer see their need for the church. And they're passionless. And their marriages are falling apart. And coming undone at the seams. You need Christ in the center. Every couple I, I counsel that is getting married. And I've got a couple weddings coming up. Every couple that I counsel. I tell them that marriage takes three. It takes the wife, the husband, and Jesus in the middle. And if you leave him out, you're already in trouble. Some of you have lost your passion in your marriage. Some of you have lost your passion in life in a general sense. Nothing excites you anymore. Some of you have lost your passion in your work. You know, we can even work as unto the Lord. You may flip burgers at McDonald's. But if you do it as unto the Lord, that is a very noble work. Amen? Amen. And as a believer... I assure you, there are people who are working side by side. They may be over frying the french fries who need Jesus. Some of you have lost your passion in your work. You're always looking for some other job somewhere else. Never, never satisfied where God has placed you. Be passionate about the job God has given you. 
Be passionate that you get to serve the Lord in whatever he has you doing. Some of you have lost your passion for your future. No goals or dreams or visions anymore. Some churches have lost their vision. I ride by some churches and, and even on the outside, it looks like nothing's happening. You never see anything going on. I pray that we never shallow lose our passion. And yes, we can lose our passion for Jesus and the things of God. And that is what Jesus is talking to this church at Laodicea about. They were deluded. Believing something that is not true. What did they believe that wasn't true? Jesus said, because you say I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That was a strong word to this church at Laodicea. Because here they were in this vibrant city. This wealthy city. Made that black wool, beautiful clothing. And Jesus told them, you're naked. You're poor. And you're wretched. That is your spiritual condition. Jesus can look past all the trappings on the outside and see the heart. Amen. Dear church, it's a sad day when we get to the place where we think we're okay and we don't need the Lord. I need him to breathe. I need him to get up in the morning. I need him to give me the strength to make it through the day. I need him to provide for me. I need, I need him to know how to live. We need him to help us be the church. A church to redeem with a passion to tell a lost and a dying world they need him too. We need him to stir in our hearts a hunger for the word of God. A hunger and desperation to pray. A desperation to share the gospel with the lost around us. We need him to keep us focused on the mission and not the petty distractions that the enemy blasts us with. We need the Lord to be his people and to be his church. Amen. Now I want to look at the remedy. Look at verses 18 to 22. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. And white garments that you may be clothed. That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve. That you may see. Remember I told you that this city was known. For their medical advances and developing eye salve and salve for the years. Jesus again pointing to their spiritual condition. Says you're blind. You may think. That you have all of this and you've done all of this, but you're blind. And he's saying, let me give you the eyes, eyes salve that will open your eyes to who I am. Jesus sternly instructs them. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich. From me, from Christ, the true and the lasting riches can be purchased. The currency of that purchase is always the same. Faith, trust, radical dependence on Christ and only Him. The cure for their spiritual poverty is the same. First comes faith for salvation. And then follows faith for walking with Jesus, for sanctification. Paul said in Romans 1.17, salvation is from faith to faith. Hebrew 12 2 says that we should keep our eyes on Jesus. The source and the perfecter of our faith. So we must keep our eyes on Jesus. And so God the Lord counsels them to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. He's the only one who can give us life and make us rich.
Amen? And then the white clothes symbolize the imputed righteousness of the Savior and the righteous acts of the saints. That's a recurring theme we see in Revelation. And it tells us how important that is. Nakedness in the ancient world was a sign of judgment and humiliation. Now, again, he was pointing to their, their desperate need here in this, this well-to-do city who made this fine black wool, who, who the people were clothed on the outside. Jesus looked at them and said, you're naked. You're wretched. Let me clothe you. With white garments and my righteousness. He was telling them that they needed a relationship with him. They needed to be saved. Their sins needed to be cleansed. They needed to be forgiven. To receive fine clothing was a symbol of honor and acceptance. And so to this church who was lukewarm, Jesus was saying, let me give you white garments. You know what he was saying to them? I love you and I want to accept you. But he was reminding them that apart from him, they were nothing. Apart from him, they were lost. Apart from him, they were eternally doomed. When we started in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 14, we saw a description of Jesus as one who had eyes that were a flame of fire. And this church before this one who has eyes as are a flame of fire. Before this one who has eyes that are a flame of fire, we are stripped, stripped naked and exposed for who we really are. We dare not stand in the filthy rags of our own righteousness and good deeds, we desperately need the righteousness of Jesus. And he gives us the remedy. He gives us the remedy. I want you also to notice verse 20. Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. So what was Jesus telling them? I'm rebuking you and I'm chastening you because I love you. And then he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. That is such a beautiful picture and such a powerful and incredible promise. Again, the invitation the Savior offers to us. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. He was saying that to this church. He wanted to come in. He wanted to be a part. He wanted to be in the center. He wanted to be the one they worshipped. And know that, that he loved them. And he offers the same invitation to us. He offers the same invitation to you. You know, it doesn't matter how deep in sin we've sunk. It doesn't matter our background. It doesn't matter how many times we fail. That invitation, if you have breath in your body, that invitation is there. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. So not only do we hear his knock, we hear his voice. Maybe some of you are hearing him this morning. Maybe some here today realize that spiritually, if the Lord were to look in your heart, would you be hot? Would you be cold? Would you be lukewarm? Would you be like the cold water that was refreshing and life-giving? Would you be like the hot water that was therapeutic and healing? Or would you just be tepid? No effect. Tasteless. How's your passion for Christ? Do you love him like you once did? 
Have you ever met him as your Savior? Oh, he's still on the throne. He still gave you the breath you just took. And he knows the last breath you'll take. Every garment that we're wearing, he gave us. And if you've ever trusted Christ as your Savior, he's given you eternity with him. If you've never met the Savior, you can meet him this morning. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, today, I pray for that one who may be here. Who has never trusted Christ as their Savior. And if you're not sure you've ever been saved. And today you would like to trust Jesus Christ. The Son of God. The only one who has died for your sins. If you would like to trust him today as your Savior. You can pray a very simple prayer. And talk to him about it. And he will hear you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. All you have to do is admit to him that you are a sinner and you need Christ to save you. You can pray a prayer like this, dear Lord. Thank you for loving me so much. Father, forgive me. Of my sins. I believe that Jesus died for me. On that cross. Come into my life. Lord Jesus and save me. Lord I believe in you. And I want to follow you. The rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer this morning and you've never done that, I'm going to stand right down here. Benji's going to come and lead us in a song. And that's a time of invitation. That's a time for you to come. And I would love to pray with you. But by all means, let, let me know that you made a decision for Christ today. Because we want to help you grow spiritually. And we need to take that step. We need to acknowledge Jesus publicly. And so let me encourage you. If you prayed that prayer today and you were saved and you know that you just trusted Christ, you come so that we can rejoice with you this morning. Acknowledge the Lord in that way. And believers, maybe as you took a few moments and looked in your own heart, how's your passion? I pray that you'll go home today and ask yourself that question. Spend some time with the Lord today. It is the Lord's day. Amen. Spend some time with the Lord today. Ask him to show you where you are spiritually. And then have the courage to do what he tells you. Amen. Benji, you come and lead us.